So my name is uh, Fedorin Dadny, indeed, uh, and I'm a software engineer at PayPal. Also, I'm a Node.js technical steering committee member, basically a core team. So today's talk topic is going to be about memory layout of V8's heap. And V8, if you don't know, it is a JavaScript engine. It's open source project by Google. This engine powers uh, both Node.js and Chromium browser and some other projects. It's uh, written by really clever people. It's <laughs> probably the best description I could give to it. And uh, it has a beautiful collection of compiler tricks and just fascinating subject to study. Nowadays, it's hardly possible to imagine a JavaScript application that wouldn't use a high level data types. We all create options object and pass them to initialization methods. These methods could iterate through properties of the objects and could check some of them or could update probably. And uh, all of this is really high level. We can create classes, we can instantiate them, we can pass callbacks and even callbacks are objects themselves. JavaScript is truly high level language. And the reason for this is this way we can better convey our desires to low-level machine, which actually operates on the binary forms. So this way, we can create a readable and straightforward code. And I guess our brain kind of works better this way. So CPU, on the other hand, sees things completely different. It sees the memory, the big chunk of it, as a big buffer or unit 8 array. And it can read bytes and it can store them after updates. It can walk through this memory and do many things. Uh, usually, though, uh, it operates on so-called machine words, which uh, on 64-bit architecture are 8-byte sequences, or just 64-bit numbers. So it could be better represented by uint64 array if there would be such a thing in JavaScript. So I think it's going to be soon, though. So <laughs> it's a good news. So the natural question out of this incompatibility of high-level objects in JavaScript and low-level binary stuff in CPU, how do we feed this high-level data into low-level mediums such as computer's memory? And the answer to this is a memory layout. Memory layout is basically like a database schema. So it's a description of high-level objects in a simple binary form. And uh, it could be simple, but if you do it simple in a JavaScript engine, it's most likely going to run really slow. So V8 uses some tricks to make it run blazingly fast, and I'm sure that many of you appreciate it in some way. Before we'll dive in into this vast subject, uh, I would like to quickly mention a tool that uses this memory layout. This tool is named LLNode. It's a plugin for LLDB. LLDB is a debugger for C++ applications, but with the help of LLNode, it can also debug JavaScript applications too at the same time. So a uh, small demonstration of uh, what can happen here. So there are a few commands. One of them is v8 backtrace. With this command, you can print current stack trace of application, either at the time of the crash or at some C++ breakpoint. Sorry, no JavaScript breakpoints just yet. And uh, in this stack trace, there would be both C++ and JavaScript frames. And for JavaScript frames, you can see, probably, there are descriptions of functions. There are function names, source code locations, arguments, and even the value of this. There are big numbers right next to everything here. And you can use this number to inspect it in detail with v8 inspect. So it's just v8 inspect, address of an object, and it will print its properties or anything else. It could also inspect the functions themselves to see the closure variables. So this tool is really useful if uh, you run JavaScript code in production of the service, because you can just collect core dumps and then inspect them to see what went wrong without just guessing from the stack trace. So whole separate module inside of LLNode is related to identifying and fixing memory leaks. And uh, it has a few commands, but all of them are really useful. One of them is v8 find JS object. It will go through all V8's heap and find every live object at the time of breakpoint. It will count them. So it will count instances of each class and print them in a sorted order. So you can find which class leaked most. And then you can take this class name, for example, this uh, my class here, and feed it to V8 find JS instances. 
to find all of the instances of this class. So now you can take this address and feed it to V8 inspect and see what was inside of this object. Or you can use V8 find refs and this address to find all retainers of the object, which is really useful. All of these commands is not just uh, abstract stuff. I used this recently to identify and fix a memory leak, a huge one in a TLS core module in Node.js. So really useful. All right, uh, getting back to memory layouts. The most important thing, ironically, about them is um, called small integers, or SME. And the reason for this could be better understood from example. So, as we know now, object internally for the CPU, JavaScript object, of course, is represented by a uint64 array in some sense. So let's say that we would like to read some value out of it, some property. We do it by loading a machine word from within it, and we get, of course, a machine word. So we get a 64-bit number. So what this number means from the point of view of compiler? It could be either a, an address in the global memory, so it could be an offset or a pointer in terms of C and C++, or it could be just a number. So how do we tell? One way to solve this dilemma is by calling everything a pointer and essentially just putting integers inside of the boxes. So this concept is called boxing, and it's quite good, and it works pretty much good, um, but unfortunately, most of the applications uh, nowadays work with integers. So they iterate through arrays, so you have a for loops, or they just uh, add a few numbers together, but this happens quite frequently, surprisingly, even considering that the language is really high level. And so if we'll make it in this uh, simple and straightforward way by putting everything in boxes, in boxes, it will make applications slow. So to make integers great again, uh, we will need to introduce some kind of different concept, which is called tagging. So with tagging, we use one uh, sort of semi-secret about the pointers about addresses in a global CPU memory, all of them are usually aligned. So they have low bits set to zero. Or in other words, they are a multiple of uh, the size of machine words. So if machine word is eight bytes, every set in the memory to some object is going to be a multiple of it. So it's going to be eight, 16, 24, whatever. And this means that low bits, and you just checked uh, lightning talk about the binary, so you should know something about it, I hope. So low bits are going to be zero, and we can use them for integers to distinguish them from the pointers. This is what V8 does. Uh, let's say we could put one in this one of these low bits for small integers. So what would happen? Application is going to run really slow. Because even simple addition of one plus one in JavaScript is going to be something like this. Technically, ones will turn into threes because you will set the first bit to one. So it's going to be three shifted to the right, sum it with SME, uh, three shifted to the right two, and then tagged again. So it's going to be five operations instead of just one. And then it's kind of inefficient, obviously. However, if we'll use zero instead, everything will be automatically tagged. So one will become two in this tagging scheme, and we'll, when we just add two plus two, we're going to get four. And four is a two tagged to this scheme. So everything is automatically tagged. However, on the other hand, we can no longer uh, just assume that pointers are going to be with zero bits because we used one of them. And uh, Zeus V8 defines the pointers to be actually address minus one. All right. So this tagging scheme, despite that it's very good, doesn't quite work for floating point numbers because floating point numbers use all of the bits from machine world. That's why, in the first place, I called these integers small ones because we eight limits them to 31 bits. And uh, for floating point numbers, it actually boxes them. So it's kind of two concepts at the same time. Okay, so now we know uh, that we are loading an object uh, from the, another object. So the thing that we load is a machine word as a pointer to that object. Given this pointer, what question can we ask about it? So what is this object about? So what is the type of this object? And uh, the truth is that in JavaScript, there are just so many types, and many of them can be created in runtime. So you can declare a class at any point of application. You can require modules that does it. And uh, technically, types are dynamic. So we need some way to 
understand this from the point of view of CPU. And the way V8 does it is by introducing another kind of objects, which are called maps. So map is essentially an object type. This is really a V8 internal terminology. So if you will ever decide to check V8 source, you will see lots of this stuff there. So there is a map for each type. And the map is stored in the first machine word of every object in V8. And there is a map for Boolean type. There is a map for, spring, uh, for strings, uh, for um, various types of strings. There are many of them in V8. There are a map for JavaScript objects themselves. And of course, there is a map for a map itself, because it's an object in V8's heap. So in some way, maps arrange themselves in a tree-like structure with the root of the tree looping to itself. So the root map is a map of itself. OK. Uh, speaking of uh, maps, in a LL node, you can see what is the map of the object by using V8 inspect-m. So you can type V8 inspect-m address of object and for print map and object contents. And you can inspect the map itself, just like in this example. And uh, the map contains some properties, some description of a type, uh, the name of constructor, and the reference to constructor itself. So now I would like to tell you a secret. Uh, have anyone here heard about the thing called hidden classes? Does it sound familiar? Yeah, I see some hands. So uh, maps are the same thing as hidden classes, it's just a brand name. So this is uh, the reason why we it runs fast, fast because it uses maps. And also, one more thing, why, why you should care about performance and why you should care about hidden classes. So whenever you add or remove a property from some instance of a class that wasn't originally there, a new child map is going to be created instead of the old one, and an object will get it. Why is it important? Why is it this way? It could be better understood by example again. Suppose we would like to load a property out of the object. We can do it in two ways. One is slow. A slow way would be to take the list of all properties, iterate through them, find the matching one. It kind of involves various, uh, like, vast amount of memory loads. Uh, even in the case if we use a hash map, it's still going to be a few loads from memory. And there is a fast way, on the other hand. Uh, we could have, um, in terms of this uh, pseudo JavaScript code, we could have some kind of branch. And this branch, we can check the object's map against some known ones. And if we know the map, we essentially know what type of object is here. So we know what properties it does it have. And we can know at which offset inside of the object the value could be stored. So in this code, you can see that we can check the map and load properties straight away out of it. And this is really a fast way to do it. And this is why V8 is so fast in some sense. There could be several clauses in this branch one for each map. And uh, of course, if no known map uh, has been matched by this uh, branch, there is a fallback to slow version. And uh, here comes a really important trick in V8. This fallback can actually create more clauses here. So whenever V8 sees a new type, it can extend this branch. And it still will run really fast. And one more thing is that V8 uh, does this for unoptimized functions too. So even unoptimized code that wasn't optimized by V8 yet is going to be really fast. And it can use this type information, because each map is a type. It can use it later on when it will optimize the functions. So my advice would be, as usual with the hidden classes, to pass same types of objects to the functions that are going to be performance criticals, that are going to use this object. OK, so we know how to check a type. And we can tell that uh, the thing that we loaded out of the object is actually a JavaScript object, too. So except for the map, what else can we find inside of this object if we we'll look at it uh, from the point of view of CPU? There is a pointer to array of so-called string properties, pointer to array to the number properties. Uh, number properties is technically created in this way, when you have a as an, uh, a set property on A, which is 0, so A bracket 0 equals 1. It's also called elements in V8. And there are also in-object properties. In-object properties are what, may, uh, what, mean, what make an line caching fast, so it's what uh, makes this branch that we just seen really fast, because we don't need to look up in some external array, we just take the properties straight of the object. And a description of these in-object properties 
or a fast properties is located inside of the map. So a map contains their names, it contains the meta information like configurable, enumerable. So if you have seen object dot defined property, you should pretty much know what this is about. All right, uh, so it was a quick dive in into my real layout of V8. And uh, I would like to quickly mention LNode again. So LNode uses all of this to make postmortem debugging available on Linuxes. And LNode is actually inspired by plugin for MDB that which uh, which was written by SmartOS team, but uh, it wasn't really usable everywhere because it just worked on SmartOS only. So the way to install LNode on OS X is to use brew is the best way to do it, and it's going to be brew install LNode. Just make sure to read the nodes that will print after installation because you will have to link it. So you will have to run the command after it finish. And uh, it's going to be available on every LDB run. And you can start LDB with this kind of command. So it will start a node under LDB on macOS or every other operating system. And when you use abort on a code exception flag for Node.js, Node is going to crash in a hard way on exceptions. So it's going to trigger crash handler in LDB. Otherwise, it's usually just exiting this non-zero code. So you can run it this way, let it crash, and uh, then use any of commands that we talked about. LNode lives under Node.js Foundation around, uh, right now, and it has received uh, numerous contributions from IBM and uh, Alibaba. And um, it's written really simplistic C++. Um, there is not so much uh, complicated stuff in there, so I really urge you to take a look at it. And if it's uh, for some reason incomprehensible in some parts, open an issue, I'll make sure to fix it and make it possible to read. It should be easy. And of course, if you feel like you want to do something, ask me and we'll find a way for you to contribute. So that was it. Uh, thank you so much.